I also like to thank South Arts for making it possible for me to, to deal with this residency. And basically, I wanted to do my residency here in Whiteville to expand on the story, to talk about my origins, to share with you uh, everything that I've experienced, or most of the things I've experienced, and how it affected me, and how Whiteville affected me growing up. Music is a language, and it's a way of communication that it doesn't matter if you're white or if you're black or if you're Hispanic or if you're Asian, it doesn't matter. Music is a language that we all can use to communicate with each other that brings us closer together. You agree? It brings us closer together. A lot of times I've been in different parts of the world where folks, we didn't even speak the same language, but we were able to pick up our instruments and then get down, you know? We was able to just pick up our instruments and just talk to each other just like that. And that's important. Now you have styles and you have um, um, trends that happen in the music business, but basically it's the same. The, the music business is the same. Now, I want to talk about three different points. I want to, I want to concentrate on three different points in the music business because a lot of times you might think that you want to become a guitar player or a piano player or a saxophonist or a singer. But you know, when you're moving in that road, when you're moving down that road, of course, education is important, be it a school or being self-taught. Either way, the education is important so that you can be able to do what you do and know how to do what you do. Now, so you're moving down this road. Everybody thinks that they want to become, you know, the next famous this, the next famous that, in terms of an instrument. But sometimes things change. And they don't necessarily change for the worse. They can sometimes change for the better. There's this road that you, that you move down, and then when you get to a certain point of that road, things branch off. For example, I think that I want to be this bass player. And all of a sudden, one day I'm sitting with my friend in, the, in, in our garage or our room and we're writing a song. And then all of a sudden, we write this song together. Remember, I'm a guitar player or a bass player. But this guy and I, we come together and we write a song, right? This song is hot, it's like killing. It's like, woo! song. Somehow we might be able to get that song played, or that song might become popular. Popular to the point where it's a very successful record. It becomes a hit record, as they say. Wait a minute. You say, wait a minute. I was on the road to becoming, thinking that I wanted to be a great bass player or a great drummer or a great guitarist. I wrote this song, and this song is a big record. He said, wait a minute, I can do this again. It maybe took me five minutes to write this song. Maybe I could write another one in five minutes. But wait a minute, what happened to the idea about the bass guitar? <laughs> wait a minute, no, or, or, or the organ or the drums. You being a successful songwriter doesn't have anything to do with you becoming a great bass player or a guitar player or musician. You, you understand what I'm saying? The idea that you wanted to become a musician on a certain level might take a back seat for a moment because now you kind of you found something you found something that you didn't know that you that you had. You found you discovered something that you didn't know. It has nothing to do with you playing the bass because if you wrote that song and that song was successful, you can do that again, and you can do that again with playing the guitar or the bass or the saxophone. It has nothing to do with that. Something else. You might say, okay, I have my band, but this weekend we're gonna we're gonna do a concert. So you say, I'm gonna do this concert, 
I'm going to promote the concert. I'm going to get the place where the concert is going to be held. I'm going to pay for the, the water, for the people drinking the water or whatever, the food. I'm going to pay for the food. I'm going to pay for the musicians, you know. And then a lot of people come to that concert. I mean, the concert is a success. You didn't even think that the concert was going to be that much of a success. It became a success. A lot of people came to the concert. You made some money. You say, wait a minute. Hmm, I can do that again. Let me try to do this next weekend. Let me call my friends. Let me call my friends out and say, look, man, we got a jam session happening. We got a concert happening. Tell your friends. So now, last week you had 50 people. Next week you got 100 people. You say, wait a minute. This is. I didn't know that I could do this. I didn't, I didn't know that I could really do this. Now, what do you? Not only, not only are you a guitar player bass player, and now you're a concert promoter. Now you are a concert promoter. I'm going to take one more, I'm going to take one more thing, and then I'm going to get into this. You might have a studio. Right now, recordings are small, little digital devices. You can record on your iPhone or your telephone now. You say, okay, we're going to start the studio up. Maybe I can rent my studio. I have a studio in my house. Maybe I can rent it out. Okay, so somebody said, well, I want to rent your studio. How much does it cost? Okay, it costs $50 an hour. You got somebody that wants to come into your studio and, and, and rent three hours of the studio, studio time. That's $150. You say, man. I made $150 today. I, I mean, so you have people coming in at three hours a day. Was that 150? Two days is 300. Three days that's that's uh, 600. By the end of the week, you might have made $1,000. $1,000 just having your recording studio. So I'm saying that to say that, and that has nothing to do with you being a guitar player or a bass player or a drummer. You're going to still be able to do that, but you might have found another way of making income. Because today, in the music business, you have to have several streams of income that's coming in. You, we, you know, as not even musicians, you know that anyway. If just as a person who works, you know that if I got this job, I can make, I can make some decent money here. If I have that job, I can make some decent money here. And it all adds up at the end of the day. So let's talk about this. Because I'm concerned about the musicians. And after we talk about all of this, we can we can we can ask questions or whatever. Because I'm, I'm concerned about the music business because the days of you putting your hard-earned energy into your work and not getting anything from it is over. Those days are over. And if, if, if I have anything to do with it, I'm gonna share with you guys, if not everything, but most things that will help you stay out of trouble in this business. Because you got guys and people that they're willing to take advantage of you. Just like anything else in life, you got people in the business who are willing to take advantage of you. The days of, oh, let me go into the studio and make this record, and oh, I'm going to give you a car, or I'm going to give you uh, a few dollars here, and you're going to sell me all of your music, and I'm going to take all, I'm going to take not only 50%, but I'm going to take 95%, and you're going to have 5%. No, those days are over. Those days are over. And the younger folks who are involved in the business, they need to know how to operate in this business because it is a business. We have fun playing, but at the end of the day, it is a business. Okay, so let's talk about that. Music professions, job description, and sources of income. The music artists. Touring, concert fees, merchandise and CD sales, t-shirts, studio, session musician, TV commercials, film score, score fees. That's a lot. Okay, touring. We all know, we all know what touring means. You got a band, you make a record, you get on the road, and you tour. You go to Chicago, Whiteville, Whiteville, Asheville, Nashville, Philadelphia, blah, 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 blah. You all go all the place with touring. That's the way of making money in the business, okay? So you gotta make sure that you got a good manager 
It's going to make sure that you're not going on the road for a whole year and it's, when it's time to get paid, you get $200. <laughs> now, I, I, I mean, it's funny, but it's not funny because it's, it's serious. This is the kind of stuff that has happened in the business. Okay, so touring is one way of making money. Concert fees, when you play concerts, you can, if you play with individuals, if I play, if one person asks you to play with them, I can tell them, uh, this is my fee. If you want me to play with you, you have to pay me this amount of money. And if they agree to it, then we have a deal and we can do that. You guys know that, how it is when you play the gig. Somebody says, look, man, we got a gig. We all gonna make $200, we all gonna make $100. Right? You agree? Fine, no problem. Concert fees. Merchandising, CD sales, merchandising. Merchandising is a very important part of the income stream now as well. It may be, it even might be a little bit even more important because CD sales are no longer popular anymore. How many people have even CDs in their house? I mean, in their homes. I mean, some of us do. I mean, we saw the, the concept of cassette. Of, you, young guy, you know what a cassette tape is? You know what a cassette tape is? You, you do. Yes, you do. So, cassette tapes, there were eight track tapes before cassette tapes. <laughs> A-track tapes, cassette tapes, and then there was then there was CDs. And vinyl, the record which DJs played was actually on, was on its way out. So when CDs came, that was the, the popular medium at the time. Right now, I don't know many people. You can't even go into a store and buy a CD player. You can't go, not unless you can go to a flea market. You can find a CD player there. But for the most part, no. Maybe you might have one in your car. I have one in my car. And that's the only time that I'm going to listen to a CD because I can't listen to it at home because everything is digital. So now, man, merchandise. You can, when you go into your show, you can make money by printing up your t-shirts, printing up your hat. You might have a jacket like this. You might go, you know, your name is um, Bo Diddy. <laughs> My name is Bo Diddy, and I got Bo Diddy on my jacket, right? So that's just, you know, and you could just you could say I'm gonna sell this jacket for a certain amount, whatever whatever you want to charge for it. You got on the side of the stage after the show, you got all your merchandise over there. People are coming up, well, I want to buy that T-shirt, or I want to buy that hat, I want to buy those shoes, or whatever. So merchandising is another way, another way to make money in this in this business as an individual artist. T-shirts, yeah. studio, as a studio musician, I can say, you have a studio, okay. Quincy Jones call, calls Chris Ruda. Chris Ruda is the guitar player, he's gonna play, he's gonna play with me tonight, we're gonna do some special stuff for you. Quincy Jones calls Chris up, he finds Chris somehow, internet, or friends, or whatever, you have a network, I know this person, he's a good guitar player, Calls Chris up. Quincy Jones, Stevie Wonder, they call Chris. Chris says, Stevie Wonder says, Oh, I want you to come to my studio and I want you to record with me. Chris has the opportunity now to say, Well, if you want me to come with you, this is my fee. This is what I had mentioned before. This is what I'm charging to be able to do this recording session with you. It can get kind of tricky in the studio. I'm going to make this really quick. A lot of times in the studio, and you have to be careful, studio musicians, you have to be careful, because you can go into the studio and there's supposed to be a song that's already, it's supposed to be already written, but not really, because the musicians, when they get there, they start change, they start helping the producer out. The producer comes in the studio and, oh, I'm the producer, and this is what we're going to do today. But and, and, and all he has is maybe some chords. But when the drummer sits down to play, he starts getting that funky beat or that groove happening. Or the guitar player starts doing that chinking, or, or, or the bass player starts. They are the ones that are really making that song happen. They are really creating that song. So you gotta be careful. Because now, if I play a part and you use that part in the song, I am what? Co writer. I'm part co writer. So now we got into a, we, now we have to get into the, the discussion about me being a 
co-writer, you got to share some of that money with me. I'm not going to just give you my, my creativity. You walk out the studio with it, and I see nothing else after that. So now we got to pull together this out look. I know this was your song. And don't be shy. Don't be shy. Because this happens all the time. Guys get in the studio, they feel good, they start jamming. But that guitar player came up with a part that was a, a really important part in the song. When the record comes out, you hear that part, you say, oh, that's the record I know because I remember that guitar part. Or I remember that bass part. Because we played um, Ain't No Stopping Us Now the other night by um, McFadden and Whitehead. We played it in, in, in the Shepherd Frog of our concert. The bass line was right? That bass part, that bass part is a hook. It's a hooky line. You remember the song from that bass line. So you got to be careful when you go into the studio, you're writing songs. If you come up, if the person comes to you in the chorus and you come up with a line, or you come up with a part, you got to say, look, man, <laughs> you got to share some of that song with them. And don't be afraid to do that. TV commercials, same thing. If you're at home, you know, you're at home listening to, uh, you know, looking at TV, you know how these little jingles come in, like these little music parts come in, you, you don't think anything about it. But these little parts are pieces of music that somebody has actually sat down and thought about, conceived it, put it together, and put it out there, right? So you can make money by doing TV commercials. Again, the business of that is very clicky. It's not about what you know, it's who you know. If you can follow me. It's just like any other business. It's not like, oh, I'm a great songwriter. I know how to play the guitar, or I know how to play the bass, or I know how to write things. But it's not about that. It's like, did you go to that party? Did you hang out with that person? Which I don't like to do. And that's probably why I'm not extremely successful, because I don't like to hang out like that. In this business, folks like to hang out. They like to rope shoulders with each other. They like to, you know, like, oh man, this is my man here, and you know, let me introduce you to my guy here. You got to be, I'm like, oh, <laughs> this, this, you know, just take me to my town. But it's, it's, sometimes it's not about that. It's about who you know. It's not about what you know. It's who you know. And you can have a person <laughs> who's less talented than you. That person, you might know more about your instrument or your or or, or, or your, your your craft than they do. But that person, they on the phone. They're like, eh, what can we meet? What, what does that mean? Oh, you know, it, you know, it's the kind of person that's like always wanting to climb the ladder. And and they're and most of the time, those kind of people are successful because they, you know, they they get in there, they get in, they get in there, they you know, they try to make some things happen. So. TV commercials are like that. The TV commercial business is run by a very small group of people who are making these little songs for cereal and, and water and, and all, like all this stuff comes to, and, and it's kind of subliminal because all of those songs they 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 just sort of just brush by you and you don't even really know that they exist until you hear the song out of context. If you heard the song, for example. What's a good song that you hear from a commercial? Chris Stapleton. What's that? Chris Stapleton with the trucks, the Which, truck commercials. Oh, that's down here, though. <laughs> I don't know if I heard that up there. <laughs> I mean, like, a, you know, like a big, um, well, for example. Who? Etta James. Etta James? Yeah. Which, which, which commercial did they use her song in? A lot of songs. Okay. A lot of commercials, okay. At last. At last, okay, At yeah. Last. But it's a lot of stuff. You guys know what I'm saying. So if you're going to decide to do that, try to, you know, get your writing skills together so you can do that. Um, film scores. Film scores, <laughs> man, it gets even deeper. Because now we're talking about music for film. And that is a, Hollywood is a very extremely clicky club situation. You really got to know people there. You know, and it's like, it's, it's I, I, for me personally, I just can't get involved with, I personally can't get involved with that scenario to talk about who I know and this and that and the other. I, it's just not me. But some people are like that and they, they're successful. Uh, score arrangements. 
if you can write, if you've been trained classically uh, to write music, there's a possibility that you can make income that way. Because you can write for orchestra, and then you can write for score arrangements for TV and film commercials. Publishing deals. Publishing deals is when you are getting in it, uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a right that you have of being a part in the writing and the publishing of your own material. You are the rightful owner of the publishing. Some people will try to take your publishing. Some people will try to take your writing credit as well as your publishing. So you have to be careful of that. But if you're able to land a great publishing deal, you are able to get an advance from that, and that is also another stream of income for you as a artist. Is anybody out there a music attorney? Is anybody out there an attorney? A lawyer? No. That's another way of making money. But it used to be ruthless before. I think in the 80s, in the 1980s, when record labels were giving big deals to artists, the lawyers were the, one that were the ones that were making the deals, and they were the ones that were making the money. They were the ones that were making the lawyers, and, and, and also, and it was crazy, but you would also, at that moment in time, in the history of the age, you would also see lawyers inside of the studio dictating how the song should go, which was weird, which was strange and weird, you know? But as a, if, you, if you're an attorney and you know how to work contracts, you know how the contracts are supposed to go, you can make money doing that. Doesn't mean that you have to be a bad attorney, you could be a good attorney. And that could be another way of making income. Um, recording engineer. Now you have to be somewhat of a recording engineer anyway just to get your ideas down. If you have a studio in your home, home studio, you can actually take that information and take it further by being a sound engineer. Sometimes um, if I'm working on something, Greg here, who you've seen him walking up and down, Greg Mann, just give a hand for Greg Mann, he's been here in Whiteville for about a week now, working with us and making sure that the sound is good, making sure that everything is, is happening with the sound and, and our video recording. But I might have worked on a piece of music and I would send it to Greg to mix it or to master it. The, the difference now in, in that we have digital, uh, we have a way of making our music in a digital way. So I can actually send Greg a file through the internet, and he can work on it at his leisure, send it back to me, and I can do whatever I want to do with it after that. But Greg finishes that work, I got a pain. Right? So that's the way of making it. That's another way. If you are working with your music, if you're working with your music equipment and you are very proficient at it, you know how to do it right, and you know that the work that you're going to do is going to be, uh, somebody's going to be satisfied with it, they're going to like the work that you do, that's another way of making money. That still has nothing to do with your drumming. You still you still get drunk. Somebody might say, look, I want you to mix this, this record for me. I want you to master this record for me. If you know how to work in here, you can do that as well. Music teacher. Are there any teachers here? Well, you're all the teachers, you just don't know it. Right? <laughs> because any information that you have, you can impart it to someone else. You can share it with somebody else, whatever it is that you have. And mothers are our first teachers. A music teacher is another way of, I mean, you know. I'm moving into that space now because I've been on the road so long as, a, as, a, as an artist. I knew that I wanted to give back. I mean, I'm sitting here now. I'm just talking to you guys, sharing with you guys information that I've learned over the years. But I never really thought of myself as being an actual teacher, right? I always thought of myself as being someone who is working 
doing what I wanted to do, and by chance, if what I was doing, if somebody saw it, and they were interested or inspired, then we can have a conversation about it. But right now, I'm moving into that direction, but one can learn how to do certain things in the music business or their particular instruments in teaching. They make money doing that. I mean, you might say, well, you know, yeah, I'm a guitar player. Yeah, I'm like, okay, teach. You can make 25 to 30, 50, 60, 70 bucks an hour. I don't even know what the, the rate is. I think I heard somebody was charging like $100 an hour. You know? And that's good money. You got three students a day? That's 300 bucks a day. Okay, so maybe not be 100. Maybe you might have a student, you might, you might have one student, you might be getting like 50 bucks, you know, in, in, an hour. Two students a day, that's 100 bucks. That's money. That's good money. You got four students, you do the math. There ain't nothing wrong with that. So that's another way. Music journalists, that's another thing. You, who, who, are we, are, do we have any writers here? Anybody who really loves to write? You. You love to write. <laughs> and she plays bass, too. Okay. She plays bass, too. Okay. Guitar, guitar, guitar. There's a bass okay. player over there. <laughs> okay. Well, there are, we don't have yeah. But as a journalist, a music journalist, okay, so we had, I heard, well, I saw it. I did see the, the newspaper, the news reporter here in Whiteville, but they had me on the front cover. That was kind of cool. I was like, wow. <laughs> but the guy who wrote that article, Grant, he, from the news reporter, he was at the show at the Chef and Frog. He was there with his pad, and he was there with his camera. He's a music journalist. So you can do that as well. If you have a love for music, they said, look, you can go to three concerts. <laughs> you know, somebody's playing, they said, look, go out and write about this. Write about what you saw. Write about what you experienced that night at the concert. So that's another way of making other forms of, of, of income as a musician, as an artist. Are you guys with me? Yeah. You guys with me? Because I'm serious. I mean, I want you guys to understand this because you might say, well, I never thought about that. Let me try that. Let me try it. Let me try it. <laughs> okay, so now, self-producing. We spoke about home recording, laying tracks, remote collaborations. I spoke about remote collaborations with, you know, Greg Man. And, other engineers who I work with, you know, sending songs to them, the working on them, sending them back to me. Um, manufacturing the CDs or LPs. Um, there are certain companies that will do that for you. We've been very fortunate to work with disc makers. You've heard of disc makers. Come on, you guys, you guys have been <laughs> Okay, disc makers is a uh, company that will make your CD for you. They make the CD, you know, they can do everything online, they can do, you know, do the artwork. If you have, if you don't have anyone to do the artwork, they can do all the artwork, blah, 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 send it to you. We found a cool company called, what's it called, um, Atomic Disc. What are they charging, like a person? You can get like 100 CDs for like $150? Yeah, 100 CDs for like $150. That's cheap. So if you're selling your CDs like one, like each for $10, CD for like $10? 15 bucks, you know, that's quite a markup. Mm -hmm. You pay a hundred, you pay a dollar fifty for each CD, you can sell it for 20 you can get, like, if you got 50 people in your family, come on, guys, like, buy my CD. You know? So you can, you, can, you can go home, make your little music, put it on CD, and just sell it. I mean, there's been so many people who have done that, you know, out of the back of their cars. Mixtapes, CDs, and all that kind of stuff. And now, people are going back to vinyl, getting actual record vinyl press stuff. So if you want to do that, you can do that as well. You can charge more for it because it now becomes a collector's item in this day and time. Okay, so let's move on here. Record labels, <laughs> I don't know why, but I mean, I've been forced into starting my own label only because nobody else would sign me at that particular time because nobody, no huge record labels are signing anybody now. There's some. Lady Gaga. Got Lady Gaga, Mariah Carey, you know, the big, the big names. 
They are getting signed, but you know, basic person like you and I, you know, no record labels knocking on your door. Not unless you're one of those guys that wrote a song that was like cool. Now they're going to be knocking on your door. Can we, can we talk? Can we talk? Can we talk? That's just how it goes. But for the most part, nobody's knocking, knocking on your door to sign to any labels. There were huge record deals that were happening. Great. How much was those deals in the, in the 70s and 80s? Half a million. Half a million for one record. I mean, could you imagine that? I mean, I know producers in New York. <laughs> oh, man. If we could imagine having a budget for a million, half a million dollars for or one out, you know, like these albums, these records, these records cost like, you know, I mean, they don't have to cost a half a million, but, you know, that's the budget. They're spending the money on the studio, they're spending the money on the travel, they're spending the money on the hotels, they're spending money on the, on the, on the actual work of the record. The artists themselves, they're getting certain amounts as an, as an advance so they can go buy the house. Body, Rose voice, music video. music video. So there's no labels that's really doing that. So what happens now as an artist? You say, well, you know, nobody's doing that. So you have to do that for yourself. You got to do it. For, you have to do it for yourself. And not only is that is that advantage, you have the advantage now because now you got to work <laughs> because now we got the internet. And the internet, you can go on Facebook, you can go on Instagram, you can tell your story how you want your story to be told. You can take the picture how you want the picture to be seen. You can tell the story, oh, I'm George Ward, I'm a guitar player. You know, I'm living in Nashville, I'm from Whiteville, but I'm living in, in Nashville. Now, let me take a picture with these country guys. Come on, guys, let's take this picture. Right? Put your own record out, sell your music. Been on Facebook, look, simple. I got a new record out today. I want everybody to buy it. You can say, just, I mean, like, you might say, well, you know, a lot of times my wife and I were doing a project, and sometimes I'll tell her, just put it out there. Say, just ask somebody, well, tell them what we want, what we're trying to do. Normally we go, like, no, 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 I don't want to ask anybody. I don't want to tell anybody what I'm doing. No, no, no. I'm looking for a manager. I'm looking for, I'm, I'm looking to sell these records. I'm looking for a label to partner with me. I'm looking to find a musician who does this. We have the internet now. Use it. Use it in a positive way. Because before, guys didn't have that. They had to rely on the record company to do every single thing for them. <laughs> when he came down to get paid, they was like, um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Takuma or whoever, you have to pay for the catering, for the food that was at the studio that day. You got to pay for the video. And then the limousine car that picked you up and took take you from here to there. You got to pay for that. You got to pay for this. You got a whole list of stuff that you got that has to be paid for before you get anything. So now, you being in control of the story, you say to yourself, look, we're going to spend money on this. We're not going to spend money on this. We're going to spend money on the record. We're not going to waste money going up and down, back and forth. We're going, to, we're going to spend the money where the money needs to be spent, on the writers, on the, on, on the artists. And, and you make your record like that. Or the photographer. You might know a photographer that you want to take your photo. Spend the money like that. And don't be cheap on spending the money that's going to make your product and your product sound good and look good. Because that's an advantage that we have now. So, the record labels. So, one of the things also I, I skip, um, I want to talk about artist management. That is another way of, and I, and, as, and I want to combine two things. I want to end on these two things before we get to the uh, to this uh, the music portion. Um, management agents and producers. I always tell ladies, I want to see more of you ladies become producers. Because, the, you know, the ladies, they are, they are more organized than us guys. I mean, this is the truth, right? I mean, this is the truth. It's the truth. The ladies are the ones that are putting things together. The mothers are the ones that are organizing everything. Yeah, a guy might come to the house and go like, you know, you're, 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 you're. she goes like, okay. 
if you, if you, you know, I'm the one that she's the one that she's running, really running the show. And guys, you gotta, you gotta acknowledge that. So the mind of the woman, I've come to find out the mind of the woman, how she thinks like that, she's more of an organizer. So that's all that production is. Producing a record, not, I mean, you can, well, you don't even have, as a producer, you don't even really have to have any music talent. You can say, well, I'm, I'm the executive producer. I'm getting put, I'm gonna get this record. I'm getting Lionel up Richie. I'm lining up Babyface. I'm lining up Cheryl Crow. I'm lining up uh, um, whomever, and I'm gonna put them all together. And I'm saying, okay, guys, this meeting, I want you guys to come up. I want you guys to go out, which used to be the, the, the job of the aid offers. I want you guys to go out. I want you to come back to my office Monday with five artists. I don't care where you find them, but I want five artists. And I want, I want you to, I want, I want to hear some songs that they've done and put it together. So she puts this together, or he puts this together, and now it begins the production. Producing is more than just, the better producers are musicians and artists, though, because they understand how the music works. But again, I remember in the, in the 80s when uh, a lot of like disco music was happening, a lot of the producers were DJs. And the DJs knew how to, aside from, they knew the music, but they learned how to do all the organization. So when you're putting these projects together, these, they, there's a thousand things that need to be taken care of. And I'm always encouraging the girls, look girls, become producers. If you know an artist that does good work or sings, whatever, take them under your wing, mentor them, show them how to do something. And of course, I'm talking to you guys as well as producers, but I'm, all, I'm saying that to I would like to see more women producers. Okay? And it's just a matter of just getting artists together, seeing what they do, organizing their schedules, organizing what they do. Get them in the studio if they've they written songs, hear what they've done. If it's cool stuff, if it sounds good, get them in the studio, come up with a project, and talk to them about putting something together. That's all, that's all that it is. Management agency is almost the same thing in that they are organizing all of the affairs of the artists. You know, all of the logistics, how the artist is going to get there, who's negotiating the money for the artist. And you could do that as well. You might say, look. And again, that has nothing to do with you being a musician. You can still be a musician and be a music manager. Chef Roberta, you can be a manager right now. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. You can be a manager right now. If, if, you, if you have the passion for that, I mean, everybody doesn't have the passion for that. But if you got the passion for that, you can, you can do that right now. You find an artist that's kid who's like, the artist is cool. And the, the benefit of that is that you have a chance to inspire that individual, kind of help and direct them in the right, in the right direction. Because all the stuff that I talked about before, about getting your, your music stolen from you and taken from you, you can, this artist, you can, you can mentor them, you can help them get on the right track musically and as a human being. Now, this is called, this, this um, sort of workshop masterclass is entitled Music and the Human Experience. So we talked about the music. So let's talk about the human being. Let's talk about what it is that is possible that will allow you to become as successful as you can be. We all are trying to be the best human beings that we can be on this earth. Because if you're not being the best human being that you can be, then your art and your music and everything that you do is not going to be right. It's not going to be right. You can't live. We've seen the story of the, the musician who was very talented, but yet as a human being, their choices and their lifestyle took them in other directions. And they weren't successful. They weren't successful. It's better to be a basic musician, artist, who is working. I always call myself a blue collar worker, because that's what I am. I get on a plane and I fly, I do my gig, I get in the bus or drive and I just do my thing and I come home, bring the money home to my wife, whatever. I come, I, I come home and, and, and if I want to buy me some new shoes, I buy me some shoes. If I want to go to the movies, I go to the movies. If I want to go out to dinner, I'm going out to dinner. If I want to buy something fly, I want to buy something fly. As a human being, 
That's what, I, that's what I'm entitled to do. That's what I should do for myself. But what I shouldn't do is degrade myself, disrespect myself. Use my body, which is the temple of cleanliness, make it a situation where I'm not being clean with it. Hanging out all, you can hang out most of the night, but not all night. <laughs> not all night. Now let's talk about why. Because you want to make sure that as an artist, that you are fit. I, took, I was talking to my man, Joe Holland, today. I said, Joe, how old are you? Joe said, I'm 74. I said, 74? And he's standing there like this. <laughs> I'm so all strong. And I said, 74? He said, yeah, I'm working out. Yeah. I'm not saying that anybody has to work out. But don't, don't disrespect yourself. Don't disrespect your body. Try to eat properly. I know we're down here, and I know y'all have got habits of eating. But let's, let's talk about it. Let's, let's, let's start studying what are the best foods for me. What are the best foods for me? Let's not be extreme about it. But if we, if we have fact and we've seen that this food is not good for me, and if, you, if, you, if you've heard that and you see people all around you that's ailing and being ill with, with disease of, of things that they didn't really look at or they sort of looked at it or they didn't have knowledge about it and you have knowledge about it and you still want to continue to live and eat and do those things, then they say, when you know better, you do better. So let's take that part. Let's talk, let's, let's talk about as a musician how that how all of that I said works as a musician because you can't be getting high and 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 create music and you can't be getting high and stand out all night and when you on tour you gotta be up at six o'clock in the morning or four o'clock in the morning to leave that hotel room to get to the airport and you you and, and if they, they knock on your door and you come to the door like, hey. Going on. Like, man, we, we on the bus. We can make it to the airport. Don't mess the money up. Because now, if you if you miss that flight, if you miss that flight, if you miss that flight, you didn't you didn't you didn't mess up the money. Because now, the con if, especially if you're traveling in Europe or places like that in other parts of the world where there might be like one flight a day, and you can't get and you have a concert that night. And you don't get there that night, that might be ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars that you lost. So now something something, <laughs> something, something is shifting now. And then the agent is not gonna be, the agent is gonna be, well, that's not coming out of my money. You were the one that was late. You were the one that didn't get there on time. You were the one that was hanging out all night partying, and the next night when it was time to get to the airport, you couldn't get there. So as an agent, I'm a counselor, I'm gonna get my money. That's not coming out of my money. So that, that's a big chunk of, of the tour that has been dismissed from the budget. Because now we're talking business. I'm talking business here. Yeah, we like to get on stage and play. But I'm talking business here. If you're gonna do this, if you're gonna be serious about the business, then okay. If you just wanna just play on the weekends, that's fine too. And there's nothing wrong with that because we you know, I'm that guitar player, that bass player. But now we're talking business. We have to make sure that when we did this uh, this residency, we had to make sure that we had everything that we needed to do this. We had to make sure that we reached out to people, that we did all the stuff. And it's, you know, jobs was crazy, but we do it because we love it. But we couldn't do it by like, not thinking about the seriousness of it. So I'm just saying that to say, I'm just a messenger. I'm just a messenger. You guys want to be successful? You got to look at it as being successful like that. Y'all understand what I'm saying, right? Yes, sir. Cool, cool. <laughs> so, so a human being, and you know, sometimes you have those successful, those successful human beings that are not nice people. They might be successful. Oh yeah, he's cool. You know, like you see his video. You know, he's on video plan, and you're like, oh man, you don't know him or you don't know her. So you don't really know how they are. One day you might get a chance to meet them, and you'd be like, 
That guy was the nastiest guy. That girl was the nastiest girl. She didn't even speak to me. She didn't even acknowledge me. She didn't, or he didn't even acknowledge me. I wanted to, you know, get a, you know, get a sign to it. Maybe they didn't want to sign my autograph, but they didn't even say, well, look, you know, I, I don't sign autographs, but you know, whatever. They didn't say that to me. They just looked me, looked me up and down and walked away. And you'd be surprised how many musicians and artists are like that. You know, you put your your, your hopes and your dreams, and, oh, that person, oh, they cool. No, you get to see them. So I'm saying. You don't have to be like that. You don't have to be the producer that comes into the into the studio and the musicians are there. You're going like screaming and howling and out. You know to be you know like man, get those drums right, get that right, get that guitar right. Oh, you know you don't have to be like that. You get the best situation when you come into the studio and everybody's calm and cool. And we're gonna make a record today. We're gonna make a record today, and the record's gonna be killing. The record's gonna be nice. You know we're gonna we gonna your creativity is gonna start flowing when the vibe is right. You know. You don't have to be that way. So again, that comes. So you gotta check yourself. If you are that egotistical person, check yourself. Because if something somebody's gonna tell you, what you're gonna get on stage with somebody, they're gonna, they're, gonna, they're gonna tell you. And they might tell you in front of the audience, in front of the audience. I'm serious. I've seen it. I'm, I'm not even gonna even mention no names. I wanna mention some names real bad. Why are you looking at me saying, no, no, no. I wanna mention some names bad. But this person. Oh man, this person, they, I mean, I ain't gonna say no name. <laughs> but I gotta tell the story. Everybody knows the story. This person, they were just like, this song, and, and, and this person had hit records, they were like big artists and stuff. And I finally met on that. No, I can't. I can't. But they were, they were horrible human beings. And they were horrible human beings. And then what I found out about all the other people who, who had worked with them, they said the same thing. So I knew I was wrong. I know that my feeling as a human being was right. I know that I, I, I was something about that individual that wasn't cool. Anybody else that had worked with them said the same thing. I was like, okay. But you ask, you know, you ask yourself why. Why does a person like that become successful? How do they stay successful? The creator. God. God has, if he has something for you, no one can take it from you. I mean, everybody in this life has what they're supposed to have. If it's good or bad, whatever it is that's supposed to have, God has that for you. And if you're supposed to have it, nobody, I don't care. They won't be able to take it away from you. If you're not supposed to have it, have it. I don't care what you do, you're not going to get it. So as an artist, you got to think, you got to, you have to, you have to understand that. Because this business is also very superficial. The glitter is gold and this and that and the cars and that. Oh, come on, please. Let me go home. To my, let me go home to my mom. Let me go home to my family. Let me eat some. Let me eat this good food. That's what's really up. Let me be with my lady. Let me be with my husband or whatever. whatever you know, whatever. That's what's really up. Not you know the, the glitter and the gold and stuff, all that stuff fades. All that stuff fades. You might be successful. Let me tell you something. You might have. A, you might be. A, you might have a million dollars. You might have three, four, five million dollars. But when you die, that's it. Somebody gonna spend that money. Somebody gonna get your girl. <laughs> Somebody gonna get your girl. Somebody gonna spend that money. They gonna have all your paintings, all your, your clothes, all your fashion clothes. I mean, that's real. So why why do we have to act like that as artists, as musicians? Because whatever it is for you, and then when you get this money, what you supposed to do with it? You supposed to share it. You're supposed to share that money. There's no way in the world that an artist can be a million dollar artist and not put that money back. There are some artists that they don't, you don't know what they do. You know, they say, they don't let your, what you, your left hand, what your right hand is going, whatever, right? You got some people, you got some like that. They, they, they get in charity, they get money. You don't, you never know that they do that. You know, but you got some people that they don't, they don't, they don't want to do that. You got a person who's a millionaire, get in an accident. Choke on a chicken bone. Whatever. What the money? How good is the money now? <laughs> I mean, you know, walk outside, slip, boom, bust your head on the side of the pavement. That three, four, fifty million dollars that you got, what good is it? What good is it? But yeah, he was walking around like, oh yeah, I got my yacht, I got my Benz, I got my, I got my Rolls Royce, I got this, I got that, I got that. You know? 
kid is black and white and tell them. If you, if, if you find yourself in a situation where, you, where you're, you're, you're ill, you, ain't, you can't enjoy it. My man Teddy Pennybass from Philadelphia got in a car, he's a millionaire. Got an ass man in a little wheelchair for the rest of his life. And he's not the only one, there's so many. So you have to make sure, because the Creator, the God is watching. You go, okay, oh, oh. You think you all that? You think you control just because you got a couple dollars? You think, you know, you got your truck, you got your car, you got this, you got that. You think you all that? Okay, watch this. You can't, you, you, you know, that's why people say, how you doing? I say, I'm fine. I'm, I'm not going to complain about nothing. Now, in this business, and I'm going to end with this, in this business, as in, on the human side, one has to be grateful and thankful for whatever you have. You have to be thankful and grateful for whatever you have. Yeah, this guy may have a million dollars. I got $500. But we're going to stay and be playing the same. And he's asking me, how do I play? How do I play so good? He's the one with a million dollars, but he's asking me, how do I play so good? What makes me, why do people like me so much? Why, why, why do I inspire people so much? Because I'm trying to carry myself right. I'm trying to carry myself right. And whatever it is, you can't be if the creator deems that you know makes it possible for you to have something, be grateful, be thankful for it, and share it. Because I'm saying, you guys, I'm telling you, you guys are sitting there as musicians, but I'm telling you, man, you might you might luck up and write a hit record tomorrow. I'm telling you, and that's one thing that I want to suggest to you guys. When I leave, I go, I want you guys to stick together like that, but not only play, but write songs together, collaborate with each other, write songs together. Because that's something that is, is a, a, an art that is, doesn't, doesn't happen so often now. People are at home with the computers. They're at home with the, you know, the production boxes, the dolls, and they're just working by themselves. So if you, as a young artist, get together with another young artist, y'all write songs together, okay? All right. <laughs> All right, cool. So anyway. I want to take a quick question and answer here, right? Very, very quick. And then I want to go into the, uh, to the music situation where I want to discuss about some music forms that, some music forms that exist in the world, um, how we create uh, based on sound and, and rhythm and melody and harmony. Any questions? Uh, what's your connection to Southeastern College? My con oh, my, yeah, sure. Your question was, what's my connection to Southeastern College? OK. So if you guys don't know the story, this is the story. This is my story. Basically. In the 1970s, my mother used to send me, we were from Philadelphia, and my mother used to send me to Whiteville, North Carolina, every, almost every summer, because there was a lot of gangs and stuff that was happening in Philadelphia, and she didn't want me to be uh, affected by it, she didn't want me to be uh, part of it, she didn't want me to uh, be um, harmed by it. So she would send me to Whiteville, North Carolina, almost every summer, to stay with my Aunt Lily Jones and Wade Jones. And they had, they were sharecroppers in the tobacco farm here, and I learned how to work with tobacco as, as a youth all those years. And it, that actually <laughs> taught me discipline. Because we was up at 5 o'clock in the morning, hitting that field, and trust me, I did everything. I don't know the, 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 the more younger folks here, I'm going to say older, but the, the younger folks here know what I'm talking about. And we're talking, I did everything. And I, I think my cousin Billy, he was here, he thought that I was just a, a, um, a touring, you know, I, would, I used to just tour with the tobacco. Foods. No, they, my Aunt Lily and Uncle Wayland had me in there grind. I mean, to, I did everything from cropping, to driving tractor, to getting up in the barn. Joe and I was talking about that, getting up in the barn, all right? Hitting that thing from top to bottom. Early in the morning, that dude, that 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 dude, that that watery dude coming all in your eyes, you're like ah, you know, <laughs> that to sucker, you know, to the to to to, to go with my uncle Wayne to to cure the tobacco in the morning, to the auction house. So I did it all. He can't tell me. I know. Only thing I can do was string. <laughs> Ladies had that. I could. I didn't <laughs> did that. But. She sent me down here. I learned how to work in tobacco with them. And in their house was an old guitar. And the guitar only had four strings on it. It was an old Silvertone Sears guitar. 
and it only had four strings on it, and it was probably out of tune. And I don't know, because I, I wasn't a player, I didn't know, I picked it up, and I learned how to play the song Get Ready by the Temptations. Do, 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 do. I learned how to play that on one string. So that opened my head up. When I came home, I told my mother I wanted to play. We were walking down the street, and there was a pawn shop that had a bass guitar, and I said, I'd like to have that. So she didn't say anything. Two weeks later, I had found out that my mother and my sister had bought me a guitar. I came from school, it was on boxes on the bed. And I picked the thing up, and that moment on, I just started playing. And I got in a band the next that weekend. I think I got in a band. I didn't really know how to play it, but I learned how to play it. But when I was down here working with Uncle Raymond, not only did he work the tobacco fields on the day, but he would come to Southeastern College at night as a maintenance man. And I was with him. And I don't know if the picture's up with Uncle William there in the room. OK, maybe we can show that later, in the science room. Larry, so we would, go, we, would, we, would, we would go to, to work into the tobacco during the day, finish up about 3 o'clock, we would fix dinner, we would probably take a nap. 7 o'clock, we had Southeastern College. I'm helping them in, in the rooms, cleaning, doing all this stuff, cleaning up. Back at home at 11 o'clock, probably back in bed at 11.30, back up at 5 in the morning. We did that for a whole week. So there's this connection with myself in Southeastern College, then and now. And it's a beautiful thing because now, for me, it's, it's, it's gone 360 degrees, right? I'm, I'm here, and it's a blessing to be here giving back, you know, sharing my knowledge. So now music, you know, we have, all of these different forms of music today, we have, uh, you know, we have, you know, all of these different, I would say, um, titles. I'm not really a title person. I think in terms of sound, and I think in terms of music as a whole. But because of the business of music, they have turned, they've given it terms. They've given soul music, or big, funk, rock, classical, blah, 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 blah. Polka. <laughs> Western, I think in terms of music. And I, I was introduced to a, uh, a saxophonist, a legendary saxophonist named Ornette Coleman. Ornette Coleman uh, started, I would say, really capturing the, the, the minds of folks in the 50s, in the 1950s. Um, basically being a blues player out of Texas, but was hearing something different. He was he was playing during the time of Miles Davis, um, Coltrane, Dizzy um, Gillespie, which was like they had an era called the bebop era. Dizzy Gillespie and, and uh, Max Roach, Charlie Parker, um, Ornette. When I got up out of high school, I went on the road. I got a scholarship to go to Berkeley College of Music. I decided I didn't want to go because I wanted to be a, a tour. Remember, one of the things that you can do is be a touring musician. I could have went to college, maybe became a music teacher. That's, that was my passion. I wanted to be on the road because I was already listening to records, listening to records from music, musical artists from Europe and tours that they were doing, the jazz festivals that was happening, and that's what I wanted to do. So when I got out of high school, I went on the road with an organ player named Charles Earl. He, uh, his, uh, they, his, his name was called, they had a nickname for him in Philadelphia called Mighty Burn. And Charles Erwin came out of that school of thought of the organ trio, which was an organ, guitar, drums, or organ, saxophone, and drums, like Jimmy Smith, Jimmy McGriff, you know, these were the guys that were like organ players, you know, they would have some small groups that would tour and play around. And I played with him. And then after that, after about a year playing with him, I got a call from two important individuals, uh, Reggie Lucas and James Ntume. James Ntume, who just recently passed away, um, and, James, and Reggie Lucas were in the, they were, Reggie Lucas played guitar and James Ntume was a percussionist. They were both at the time with Miles Davis. And I got a call, and actually Reggie went on to become, Reggie and, and James became, went on to become here we go again. They were musicians, but they went on to become great producers. Reggie produced the first Madonna album 
African American who produced the first Madonna record. You know, um, Reggie and 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 James they produced um, the Roberta Flack's early record that The Closer I Get to You. They wrote and produced that. They produced Stephanie Mills' first records. You know, put your body.